Good morning. And thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing some of my thinking around innovation with you here today. It's been the object of my passion for the last nearly 20 years. And my main question is always, what is it that enables under and, and helps support innovation? And what is it that gets actually in the way of it? And while thinking so much about it, I just found it's on everyone's agenda. In your organizations, in the fields that you work, is innovation on the agenda in your organization? Anyone innovation is talked about, considered to be important? And you as individuals, do you think innovation is important for us, for our future? Well, I certainly think innovation is critical but I also increasingly think that it is critical to take a critical perspective on innovation. And this is what I would like to do here. But not before just also saying, so why is it actually that we do talk so much about innovation? And I guess it's the, some of the management gurus who started us on this particular journey. There was um, Peter Drucker who said, um, the only things that matter are marketing and innovation, the rest are cost. Or, of course, um, Tom Peters who said, innovate or die. And then are then others like Malcolm Gladwell who says, innovation is the heart of the knowledge economy. So innovation is very much on the agenda and innovation is considered to be the path to our future. And it's not only at the organizational, but I think also at the societal level. Innovation is considered essential for growth, so we are told. I wonder, though, whether growth, the ultimate measure of success in the West, it seems, is really what we should be aspiring for. And I also think that innovation are growth and growth are treated pretty much the same way. It's in everyone's desire to grow and to innovate, and yet I think we have started to talk both about growth and about innovation as a proxy for something else. And in a way, I think we started about growth or GDP as a measure of improvement for well-being of people, because it was easy to measure and well-being per se is not. But do we want growth for the sake of it? And do we want innovation for the sake of it? I think not. Well, at least I hope not. I think there should be more to it. For me, both innovation and GDP are something that will help us to improve people's standards of living, which again is about improving people's lives, people's well-being. And I think the criticism, criticism of GDP is not new. And we go back to Kennedy, um, and I can already see quite a few linkages with the previous presentation. So Kennedy not only said that he wanted to put a man on the moon, but he also said that GDP is not measuring that which makes life worthwhile. And that was um, a good term 40 years ago. And then in 2007, a white paper of the European Parliament stated that GDP does not properly account for social and environmental costs and benefits. It is also difficult to achieve sustainable decision-making aiming at sustainable progress and well-being if welfare is being considered from a purely financial perspective. And of course, there is the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, who said in 2007 that there is more to life than making money and argued that we should have a growth happiness index instead of the traditional GDP. I also very much agree with a point raised by Herman Dailies in Beyond Growth, and he said, the concepts of growth and development are not the same. And funny enough, we talk about developed and developing countries, and not about grown and grown-up countries. I also quite like Delay's statement that uneconomic growth occurs when increases in production come at an expense in resources and well-being that is worth more than the items made. And my final challenge to innovation for growth is that we have one planet and one planet only. Even though you could argue from the last presentation that maybe we are creating another one, we start to live in space. So through the one planet constraint doesn't, doesn't quite um, concern us all so much in the future as maybe today. 
However, I think innovation for development is more that's close to my heart, to think about how innovation can be used to improve the well-being for everyone on the planet, and not necessarily only through the, through the means of growth. And I think that we need to move away from innovation for growth and into innovation for well-being. However, I don't think that any discussion around innovation lasts very long before the question comes up, so what do you actually mean by innovation? And so I'd like to share the definition I have come up with. Um, oops, there's one missing. There's my definition, the slides are mixed. I'm sorry, I'll go back to the dark side in a moment. But let me share my definition first. For me, innovation is about choosing the path of change to create value. And I've thought long and hard about every single word in my definition, and everyone matters to me. Why might that be? First of all, I think choice, to make a conscious choice, to make a conscious decision is really important. How many of you still make New Year's resolutions? Good. One hand goes up in the front row, brilliant. Um, how many of you have experienced successful, sustainable organizational change? A couple of hands go up. Not surprising when I see whose hands go up, in a way. But that is, is, is when sort of, you know, there's a decision that we want to change, and yet still it is really quite difficult. And that's why I think, unless we are really conscious, make a decision we do want to change, we will not achieve it. We will not be able to implement and sustain the change, because it does require a lot of courage, a lot of patience, and a lot of working against the odds in order to achieve something that stays permanently, something to change. I choose the word path because, in my view, there is no end point on the innovation journey. And why might that be? The context in which we operate is constantly changing. So it does not tick in the box, I've achieved innovation now. But there's always something else that needs doing, that needs to be achieved. And whatever is right today might be out of date and obsolete tomorrow. So we really need to think about innovation as an ongoing journey. And then finally, for me, the most important bit probably is that innovation is there to create value. And here, I'm not only talking about the financial value that is normally automatically assumed, but it's the value of knowledge, the value of well-being, the value of new insight. So there are lots of different ways of creating knowledge, and not only the monetary kind. And how many organizations do you hear a CEO standing up and say, we need to be more innovative, we need to innovate more? And that's about it. But if I'll ask you, have you got a great idea? Have you got a good idea for me? And you look at me like I'm slightly mad, probably am, but that's not the point. The point is that if I'm just asking you to be more innovative or whether you have a good idea, what are you supposed to do? And so innovation requires a direction and ambition. It requires putting a man on the moon. It requires a direction that engages people's hearts and minds and that they can follow with passion, like the space project, for example. Putting people on a daily flight into space. That is something where people can contribute towards. To me, it seems that many organizations jump onto the innovation bandwagon without questioning why they are actually doing it and what they want to achieve to it, with it. And I think that the carriages called open innovation and crowdsourcing are particularly popular and crowded ones at the moment, because everyone is doing it. And in my view, because everyone else is doing it, is the worst possible reason for doing anything. There has to be a stronger rationale than that. Of course, there is evidence that innovative organizations are doing better financially than less organi innovative organizations. And also that, particularly important in the knowledge economy, that they are able to attract the best talent. But I think because innovation is notoriously difficult to measure, uh, most organizations have problems justifying investment into that particular field. And one of the reasons I think that is, because in order to create an innovative organization, you have to have certainty 
and ambiguity at the same time and have to be able to deal with those. You have to have the certainty about wanting to change something, having a vision, having something that you aspire to, but there will generally be ambiguity about how you will achieve that vision, what it will actually look like when you get there, maybe not like the prototype, it might take entirely different form, it might not be the, the first shuttle version but the second one with two separate planes, it will change shape. And you have more normally ambiguity not only about one thing but about a lot of things, like who do we need to involve, who do we need? And if you're lucky and have a splendid vision, um, like with a, with a space travel, then probably people come to you and say, I've got the expertise that you actually need. But dealing with ambiguity is not very popular in many organizations. And just think who the people are who are in decision-making positions in a lot of organizations. Think about what a lot of organizations are constantly doing and that is driving out cost, seeking efficiencies. And the people who are really good at that get promoted because they deliver what the organization needs. Now, with being good at driving out costs and improving efficiencies comes a certain mindset. And now imagine yourself going to one of these people with an idea saying, you know what, I'm really excited. I've come up with the idea for having something about, about, about the size of a, pack, a cigarette pack. And I want it to, to, to be such that you can load all your music onto it and you can walk around with it, you can take it anywhere. What do you think if the person then asks, and what is the market size? And how exactly are you going to do it? What is the target market? What is the margin in the target market? And you say, well, I'm really not quite sure yet. I have to figure these things out. But don't you think it's a great idea that we should invest in? And I wonder in how many of your organizations the idea of the iPod, of the Sony Walkman, would have had legs, would have been pursued? And in how many of your organizations people would have said, ah, yes, you know, sounds quite of funky, but you know, if you've got the proof, it'll work, and if it doesn't cost too much money, and if you don't need to change anything inside the organization, it will be fine, we'll give it a go. So, how many questions are being asked that would enable such big innovations to come through? How many organizations ask questions about net present value, market size, and profit margin? And how many ask questions about how will it impact our brand value? And how many ask the question of does it actually, how does it affect the society and the wider environment? And this is why I sometimes think, coming back to this one here, is I really wonder how many organizations do ask questions about impact on society and the environment at a broader level when they are selecting the projects they are taking forward. And I think this is why it is important to start conversations about the dark side of innovation. And I think some of the questions to ask include, do we have too much innovation? Do we have the right kind of innovation? And do we actually have responsible innovation? Some of you may be aware of the book, The Future of Innovation, that I've um, co-edited with a lovely lady called Anna Trifilova. And one of our contributors pointed out that only 0.2% of innovation studies look at consequences and side effects. Probably not quite enough. So some of the challenges I see and I consider to be the dark side of innovation is, in my view, there is a lot of hype around innovation. Everyone talks about it. But if you challenge people to explain what they mean by it and what the implications are, organizational and probably even personal, you don't get many answers. I also think that, and possibly especially in the field of engineering, is when we can do something, we get really excited about it. We get excited about what is possible, that we do not ask the question whether it is also desirable. And uh, probably not particularly good, but effective example is if you think about all the electronic gadgets you have, the functionality that each one of those provides you with, 
And maybe it is because I'm of the female kind, but I find the variety rather off-putting and confusing, and it definitely does not enhance my experience. And so to me, it's not a surprise that products from, from Apple are such a success, because Apple has managed to have a lot of complexity and a lot of functionality, but as the user, I experience, experience simplicity. And so the dark side of innovation, another aspect of it is for me, that it is too much functionality, too much complexity, and not enough enjoyment and simplicity. Another dark side for me is that we sanction innovation in the name of convenience. As long as it makes things more convenient for us, it's okay. But just think about the negative side effects of all the convenience food or the conveniently packaged food. Whenever I come back from my shopping trip, the bin is full just by unpacking my shopping because of all the packaging that I bring home with me. And then maybe one final point, I think there is too much haste and not enough speed. In the race to the market, do we not perhaps occasionally bring things to the market that are not quite ready yet? Of course, if you're in the pharmaceutical um, industry, you can, cannot afford to do that. But there are other industries where I would think a bit more consideration and thought before introducing new things might be quite worthwhile. And the second aspect of more ha um, haste, less, no, which way, which way around is it? <laughs> more, more, more haste, too much haste, not enough speed. Is that I think the sequence with which new products are being introduced is too fast, because everyone is trying to beat everyone else. New product iterations are introduced at such a rate that I cannot possibly believe that it can be an efficient and effective use of resources. So, when you are innovating in your organizations, do you even think about the dark side of innovation? Are these questions being asked when you make decisions about which projects to take forward? Or is it we are getting so excited that this is possible that we are rushing through with it and putting it onto the market? Maybe a couple of things that might help to create innovation with a conscience. I quite like the Indian Iroquois wisdom of making decisions considering the implications for seven generations hence. That's a bit of blow in the face of short-termism, I think. Um, probably not very realistic to, to turn it over either, but I think it is worth just bearing that in mind. What about taking and accepting responsibility at the individual level? We all go shopping, we all buy things, and here stands someone who unfortunately enjoys shopping rather a lot. But we all make decisions on how much stuff we buy, how many things we accumulate. And here I would like to, to quote Stuart Hart, who points out that the average American today consumes 17 times more than his or her Mexican counterpart, and 100 times more than the average Ethiopian. The levels of materials and energy used in the US requires massive quantities and raw materials and commodities. And if China came to consume oil at the current US rate, they would require 80 million barrels a day, which is 6 million barrels more than the world's production today. So I think we do really need to rethink on how we consume, on how we think about innovation. And we need to start thinking about system things at the systems level. And I think that's probably something that engineers are very good at, understanding the wider system. I also think to really to make the best decisions, we need more openness and transparency. When I buy things in the supermarket, for example, if I buy, buy food, I do not know necessarily which the better purchase from an environmental perspective is. If I'm being told I have to buy a new car because it's more fuel efficient, is that really the best solution for the environment, for the resources? Because my car, my old car, might be putting out a few more fumes, but just consider the amount of raw materials and the amount of um, emissions that are being, being caused by the production of a new car. So as a consumer, I have a really hard time making the right decision, even if I would like to. 
And then I keep coming back to the fact that I do believe that we need a different yard yardstick for how we measure progress of the human race's development. So in short, um, I advocate an approach for innovation where a sense of responsibility goes with the excitement, no, sorry, to say responsibility, that's what I wanted to say, goes with a sense of the excitement of the possibility. And actually, for that to happen, I also believe we do need to take a different look at innovation. <coughs> we need to think differently about what when we talk about innovation. In the past, innovation was mainly associated with technology, patents, R&D departments. And I think we need to move away from that. Innovation is so much more. It's about services, processes, business models, and so on and so forth. And let me just give you one example that I thought was quite powerful when I first came across it. It is from a um, US-based chemical industry that specializes in pesticides. And in their own business model, um, the salesmen, of course, being rewarded on the volume of pesticides sold, they were trying to sell the farmers as much as ever, ever possible and justifiable. That somehow didn't, didn't feel right to some senior people in the organization, so they said, what is it actually that the farmers really want? And they came to the conclusion, what they actually want are pest-free fields. And that is what they started to sell them. For me, the beauty is that instead of being um, an item that generates the profit for the organization, the pesticide itself was becoming a cost. And that, of course, meant that they were trying to use as little as possible rather than as much as possible, which I consider a win-win situation for the farmers, the environment, and the company alike. So very much a contribution and innovation that addresses all three aspects of the triple bottom line. We also need to think about who is involved in innovating, and I've already briefly mentioned open innovation and crowdsourcing. And companies such as Procter & Gamble are very well known. Procter & Gamble has introduced the 50% of their ideas need to be sourced from the outside, and they have been very successful with it. There are companies such as Gold Corp. I don't know whether you've heard about it. I gladly tell the story at, at more length over a cup of coffee. But basically, they made Gold Corp. is a mining company, and they come to an end with their um, gold resources as they knew them. So they put all the geographical data out on the internet, something that was absolutely outrageous because they were the crown jewels of the company, right? And by making it available to everyone, people helped them to discover gold resources they never thought they had. It's a very different approach. And um, companies such as Bayersdorf, BMW, and Lego very intensively use the users in developing new products. We also think to terms and d d differently sort of why we are actually innovating. And one of the things that I, I said earlier is that I really believe that the sustainability considerations do need to be at the heart of anything that we, that we make in, in the future. And companies such as Philips or Marks and Spencer, I think, are at the forefront of that. And you know what Statoil, Johnson Johnson, and um, Novozymes have in common? All highly successful companies? Well, they were the top three in the most sustainable corporations league table in 2011. And I really think that using sustainability as a driver for innovation in the future will not be a nice to have, will not be an order winner that sets you apart, but it will be merely a qualifier that enables you to engage in playing in a particular game. In terms of where we seek, and I think this is a lot what I've seen in this conference, um, even though I've only seen a little of it, uh, is that, that design, designers, design thinking can play a very critical role in the innovation process. So let me then come to my last thoughts. What I was trying to do is just lay out my stall as to why I think there is a dark side to innovation and why I think we need to challenge more rather than accept smilingly that innovation is the most, most wonderful thing ever. We need to understand why we want to innovate and what we want to achieve with it. And we need to do so with the mind of the triple bottom line, which considers not only the profit, but very much so the, so, so the impact on society and on the environment. And it's not only about telling them to change. It's not about 
saying, well, I guess we have to change. In the end, the only thing that we really truly can impact is our own behaviors. And so I'm very much with Mahatma Gandhi who said, you need to be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you very much.